Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Watch Talk. Today on my wrist is a borrowed watch from Brellum. This is a pilot power gauge chronometer on the bracelet, and it is a very fun piece. And a full review on that will be uh, happening on the channel within the next week and a half or so. But today I wanna talk watches with you guys. And I've had a few viewers reach out and say, Bruce, I enjoy these Watch Talk uh, episodes. Could you make them a little bit longer? And so we're going to experiment with that today. We're going to run a little bit long and I appreciate you guys. So let's start. Uh, let's start with it. I've got the questions here in front of me. Uh, the first one comes from Kunal who says, tell us the story, please, on how you got into the watch hobby. What else are you interested in collecting besides watches? Regards and love from your fans in New Delhi, India. Kunal. Well, great question. Uh, I know we can all relate to this because we're all in this hobby. And I've enjoyed watches since I was a kid, as, as really as long as I can really remember. Um, I've appreciated watches. And when I was a kid, the internet really wasn't a thing. And I know that dates me a little bit. But if you wanted to buy something, a product that wasn't at your local department store, you had to order it via a catalog. And I remember having uh, just a bunch of different catalogs in my house <laughs> growing up. And I would look through them and I remember, I remember this page. I wish I knew, I wish I could remember the brand, but it was a watch and it was a pilot watch and it was supposed to be like a pilot watch from World War II. And I don't know if it was the uh, Axis side or the Allied side, but I just, I just remember becoming uh, really drawn to this watch and I really wanted it. As a kid, I was probably like nine or 10 years old and uh, I never did buy it. I didn't have enough money and I, I wish I could remember what it was at this point. I just remember it had a leather strap and it looked beautiful. But from that point uh, forward, I, I always enjoyed watches and I didn't know much about watches other than I enjoyed watches. And so I had what I would consider dark days now. <laughs> Uh, I had fashion watch days where I, I wore rose gold plated Michael Quartz, Michael Kors Quartz uh, movements, excuse me. I had diesel watches. I had, uh, forgive me, I had Invictas that were like 55 millimeter Russian divers. <laughs> and they looked so stupid on my wrist. I used to be thin as a rail, nice and trim. And so they, they looked extra silly on me. But hey, I liked watches and and I thought it was fun. Now, about 10 years ago is when I got into what we would consider traditional watches, mechanical watches, uh, very similar to those of you watching this video, what you enjoy. I started getting into that about a decade ago and I discovered what a Submariner was and what a Speedmaster was and uh, what an ETA 2824 meant. And, and it was a really exciting time. And about five years ago is when I decided to uh, start a YouTube channel and review the watches that I was picking up and experiencing and enjoying. And here I am 10 years later, and uh, I still love watches and I will always love watches. And I believe I will always wear a watch <laughs> until the day I die. I, I love watches and I'm not going to go back to fashion watch days. I'm not going to go back to uh, Invicta days or anything like that. I'm, I'm going to stick with the traditional. So Excuse me, I'm rambling a little bit, but I told you we're going a tad long today. And then the last question here from Kunal, he says, what else am I interested in collecting besides watches? Well, I don't collect much, but I do love Lego. And I know I'm not alone. I know a lot of you do also enjoy Lego. I loved Lego as a kid. I would build all sorts of sets. I didn't have the most extensive Lego collection, but um, but but I, I buy them now and I build them with my daughters. I play with them with my daughters. I display them and I, I think they're the greatest toys in the world. You know, they they kind of spur that uh, creative element of your brain, your imagination. And ugh, I love Lego. So, and, and isn't this funny, guys? I've become dis desensitized to price when it comes to watches. Like for me, an affordable watch is a $500 watch. I just ordered a Seiko from Japan the other day. Uh, I'll drop in a picture of it set me back over a thousand dollars, excuse me. And I still think I'm getting great value. I can spend money on a VC or a Rolex and be absolutely thrilled with the value that I'm getting. And then I look at Legos and I look at a, you know, the Millennium Falcon, which is like, what is it? An $800 set. And I go, Ooh, 
that is so expensive, yet I will drop that on a Seiko, I'll drop that on a Longine or an Oris or, you know, a lot more than 800. It's just funny how, how relative pricing is and how we can kind of get desensitized to value in a certain hobby and how that doesn't translate to another hobby. I, I just think that's kind of interesting, but yeah, Lego would be the other interest for me. So let's go to the next question here. This one comes from Chayan. I hope I'm pronouncing, uh, I can't even talk. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, Chayan says, hi, Bruce. I am buying my first automatic watch. And after much browsing, I have decided on a used JLC master calendar 2015 model. Before I go on, I have to say that is a heck of a first automatic watch, a heck of a first automatic watch. Wow. <laughs> Here I am talking about my Invicta days and, and stuff. And you're starting out your first automatic piece with the watchmaker's watchmaker. That is so cool. So let's continue here. Is it easy to adjust the pushers and adjust the day and date? How uh, has in your view this watch changed after the 2020 model has come out? I am thinking to buy it from Watchbox. Can you help me understand what margin I can bargain for it on Watchbox? Lastly, I read that JLC recommends servicing every two years, though they ask you to do it every five. Do you have any advice on that regards Chayan? Well, um, when it comes to the ease of operating the pushers, JLC will give you a small tool in the box when you buy the watch and you can use that to uh, compress the small uh, flush function pushers on the sides of the case. And it's really easy to do. Now, if you buy a naked example and you don't have that tool, don't worry, you can use a toothpick. You're not gonna damage the watch and uh, you're gonna be able to do it. It is very easy to adjust uh, the function pushers. Now, let me reference this so I don't forget anything. How has my view changed? Well, with the new release, the 2020 version, people generally want the latest and the greatest, and they're gonna gravitate toward that one. So that's gonna make uh, finding a pre-owned deal on the 2015 version an even more enticing proposition. So I'm gonna tell you, Go with the 2015 version, save a little bit of money because essentially they still have the same complication. It's still a, you know, it's still the watchmaker's watchmaker brand. I love that slogan too. It's not JLC's slogan. It's just a slogan that us watch enthusiasts have kind of coined for this brand. But it, man, is it a cool, <laughs> is it a cool uh, slogan? It sure is. So uh, yeah, I'd go with the older version. My, my views haven't changed. And then let's talk about pricing. What margin can you negotiate from Watchbox? So this is what I'll say. I think if you lead off with too much of a low ball offer, that's going to tell Watchbox that you're not a serious buyer. You're a time waster. You're a tire kicker. You're searching for uh, someone desperate to sell a watch that will you know, just take a, a massive loss at any cost to get rid of it. And that's not going to be Watchbox. So I would caution you against coming in with a really low bid. I don't think they'll take you seriously. Whenever I'm selling a watch and I think I've priced it appropriately and I get some low ball offer, I don't even want to respond to that individual because I don't think they're serious. So I would tell you maybe offer 15% lower than what they're asking for. Because every dealer, they have a markup of at least 20%. They've got to make some money on every watch and there's nothing wrong with that. That's how they stay in business. And they have overhead, they have servicing costs and warranty to cover and all of that stuff, salesman commission. So I'm not going to begrudge a dealer or a reseller some profit, but I would say ask for 15. I think that's right around what is reasonable. And then I, I could go down a little bit, maybe to 10%. I really wouldn't want to go anything below that because, you know, I like saving money. I like getting a deal. And so that's what I would recommend for you to do in, in terms of negotiation. But um, I've never purchased from Watchbox before, so I'm not sure uh, how uh, how they'll be to negotiate with. But I wish you luck. That's, again, a heck of a first purchase. And I remember the last part of that question. What about servicing? Should you do every two years? Should you do every five years? This is what I do. I actually don't service my watches um, until the tail end of the recommend, recommended service interval. So I would not do two. I would do five unless uh, the watch starts keeping erratic time or the power reserve obviously isn't, you know, 
isn't keeping power for very long. If there's an obvious issue when you're wearing the watch on wrist, definitely have it looked at, definitely send it in, get the service if need be, but otherwise wait at least five years. And if it's still running strong, maybe wait six years. I think brands are a little bit aggressive when it comes to the recommended service interval. They want to cover their own butts. And uh, I think you could go easily five years with this watch. So let's go to the, the last topic. I know we're running a little long, but that that's what we're doing today. This comes from Ed who says, Bruce, longtime watcher, recent subscriber, and first time messenger. Long story short, I have a sizable collection of over 20 luxury pieces, which I have accumulated over the, over the last 15 years. I am not sure where to go from here. Here's a brief rundown of my collection. Breitling Chronomat, Mont Brilliant, Transocean, and Premier, Rolex Datejust, GMT Master II and Coke, and Root Beer, and the Two-Tone Daytona. The Tudor Bronze Black Bay, the Blue Pelagos, the Grand Seiko Skyflake, and the SBGE205 GMT, the Blancpain 50 Fathoms, the Bathyscaphe Scaff Triple Calendar Moon Phase, the Omega Aqua Terra, the Seamaster 300, the Sapphire Sandwich, and the Speedy Reduced Yellow Racing. Lastly, the Paddock 5140 and 5035. Do you have any suggestions for me, Ed? Well, <laughs> First off, impressive watch collection. I know there were guys, excuse me, out there that would love, their Grail watch is a GMT Master II or a Pelagos, right? They would be so happy if they can just have that one watch. And you have a collection basically full of Grail level watches for a lot of guys. So I've got to commend you. That's really impressive. I know it's been a long journey. It's taken you 15 years and that's longer than I've been a watch enthusiast, you know, hardcore watch enthusiast. So you know, I know it's been a journey for you, but man, very impressive watch collection and a lot of variety in terms of brand, in terms of size and color and complication. And I think it's really fun. So no wonder you're kind of having a hard time looking at what, you know, what is next because the watches that you do own are so impressive and so fun and <laughs> it's pretty great. So uh, very well done. Now, what I will tell you, I look at your watch collection and it's gonna be hard to add to it and really strengthen the core of your collection. So I look and I see mostly Swiss pieces. I do see a couple Japanese pieces with the Grand Seiko. So perhaps something that you could do is buy a German brand and introduce that segment to your collection and there really is some pretty amazing stuff from Deutschland that I think would enhance your collection. And here's where I, here's where I get excited. Um, what is the, you know, what would be the, I, I'm so excited I'm, I'm fumbling with my words, but the considered best brand or premier brand from Germany would be A Lange und Zona. And they make some incredible stuff mostly in precious metal. It's all handcrafted, beautiful, sim you know, very simplistic designs that are just so elegant and well executed. And so you could go a number of different routes here. You know, you could go with the classic Lange One, which I love. That is, um, you know, that's a watch I would consider for myself one day. You could go with a Saxonia Moon Phase, which is one of you know, just the most aesthetically sharp and balanced dials that I think is out there. I, I love that watch. Or you could go with something totally crazy like the Zeitwerk. And, and that one, you know, it, nobody's going to notice that watch. Like to an obscene degree, it kind of maybe looks like a diesel watch, like a fashion watch. I know that's sacrilegious to say some, to, to some of you guys. But you don't know how awesome it is until you spend some time with the watch. And the only people that can, will really, truly appreciate that piece are other crazy watch idiot savants that are just going to be so amazed by that watch. So that's something to consider. I don't know what your price you know, range is. I don't know what your tastes are when it comes to sport pieces or, or whatnot. But uh, I'm going to assume you can afford almost anything by looking at your collection. And so those three models I might look into, I think that those could really add to your rotation. If you want to go with more of a mainstream Swiss brand, another sports piece, because I, I do see some, some very nice sport pieces in your collection, you could look at IWC. IWC makes some great pilot pieces. Those are my favorite. 
I really enjoy the Le Petit Prince color scheme. And so if you went with the big crown with the seven day manufacture movement, that would be fun. I think that would be really fun and, and a good addition to the collection. And then my last suggestion for you would be, <clears throat> it would be a watch that I want to buy. I mean, I really want to try out. I don't know if it's going to be a keeper for me, but it's such a lovely piece. And this is a JLC. This is the watchmaker's watchmaker. I don't see a JLC in your collection. And it's the classic Reverso, enlarged with the small seconds. It's simple. It's beautiful. It has history. It is a classic Art Deco design that is just so balanced with the proportions. And, you know, it's just so fun when you flip it around and, and maybe you can get it engraved on the polished case back and maybe note something of, you know, of significance to you. So those would be my suggestions just off the cuff. Hopefully I've suggested something that you're maybe interested in, but whatever you add to the collection, I'm sure is going to be awesome because you do have some great taste. And I did hear from Ed briefly before I started filming. And he said, as he waits, uh, he actually bought his wife, uh, his wife, excuse me, a paddock. So uh, I've got to say you win the husband of the year award and uh, that is pretty awesome. So well done. Uh, that's what I've got for you guys today. I know I went a little bit long, rambled a little bit. Tell me what you think of the format. Is this boring? Did you tune out? <laughs> I guess if you've tuned out, you're not even hearing me say this question, but let me, let me know. Do you like the longer videos or should I try to stick at around 10 minutes or less for the next episode of Watch Talk. And if you have a question, a suggestion, a topic that you would like me to cover, go ahead and reach out to me. I get a lot of email and I can't do topic um, videos for everything that I, I get, but, uh, but yeah, there might be a chance. Email me. Thanks for watching today, guys. I hope you have a great day and uh, we'll see you in the next video.